peeps, welcome to another video. Today it is the Vogue 9077 pattern review and sew along. As you guys know, I'm doing the sew alongs a little differently. I am putting them all into one big video with chapters so that you can skip ahead to specific parts of the video or specific techniques. I'm also putting my review at the beginning of the video as well so you guys can hear my thoughts on the pattern and then decide whether you would like to make one for yourself or not. So this pattern was voted for by the Patreon peeps and you're seeing a long list of their names scrolling across the screen really quickly right now. If you watch right through to the end their names will be going up at the on the end credits as well and I just want to say thank you very much for the Patreon peeps for voting for this fabric. I'd picked the pattern, I gave the peeps a choice of this fabric or a navy blue one, both of which were viscose from Lady McElroy of course. The Patreon peeps picked the Woodland Harmony and I am so grateful that they did because it's absolutely beautiful. So it was back in October, perhaps maybe even September last year. I had made this dress once before. I did it in a military green polyester crepe that I got from the fabric room. I think I need to go right back to the start. So basically when this pattern came out I kind of discounted it. I saw the line art on the envelope when I was looking through the new new releases that that particular I think it was a full winter might have been a full one I looked through and I was just like meh that's nice but meh then I had the Sew so Direct magazine turn up and they had a made up version in a very similar colour to this and they had put the darts on the inside and I saw the shirt dress and it was just beautiful the, the, the photo was the lady walking in motion so the skirt was swishing I was sold I was like oh I need that when I went to look at the line envelope again it was like really is this is this the same dress but I bought the pattern I made the short sleeve version in green polyester and at one point I almost didn't finish that dress. I knew I was going to make some alterations to it right from the get-go so I lengthened the button placket right down to the hem of the skirt. I don't like it when button plackets stop mid skirt or mid top for I just, it's just not something that I enjoy. That particular button placket finished at a really awkward place, especially if you were using contrasting material or contrasting colours. I just I didn't like it, so I lengthened the button placket all the way down to the front of the skirt to make it a proper shirt dress. I also added a yoke because I just like how yokes look. If you're going to make a dress with shirt-like features, a yoke seems like a, a something that it should have so I added a yoke in as well and took the box pleat out of the top of the yoke. I got as far in the dress as just putting on the collar and they would have you finish the top of the button placket and then reinforce that area cut into the fabric and it just gave it was a real area of weakness. It didn't have a collar stand and I found that I don't really like collars without collar stands if they are to be buttoned up all the way to the front like this is. Yeah it kind of sat there for a really long time. All it needed was a the, the collar finishing and I just I really didn't like it and I didn't think I was going to finish it. And then it occurred to me that I'd made a load of McCall's 6696s and I really liked the collar and collar stand on that pattern. So without measuring I just took the pattern pieces from my McCall's 6696, cut it out of the polyester fabric and smooshed it on and it worked. And I got really lucky that it worked but it did work. That made me finish that dress. I took it on holiday with me, wore it once in Croatia and whilst it looked lovely it was like wearing a personal sauna suit especially in that weather it was just not the right weather to it just this one of the reasons I don't like wearing polyester is it just it's uncomfortable to wear the polyester itself was you know very nice quality and if I'd have used it for something that wasn't tight well not tight but fitted against my upper body probably would have been fine but for it for the shirt dress no I knew I wanted to remake it in a viscose. I put it up for a vote on Patreon as I've mentioned and it was a choice between this fabric which is Woodland Harmony viscose which has a little stretch in it which is nice and the Naturella bouquet fabric which is a navy floral. The Patreon peeps picked this one. I decided that I was going to make a wearable muslin because the previous dress I'd found I was getting some pooling in the back and I wanted to do a very small sway back adjustment. I also wanted to tweak the fit at the waist because I put quite a lot of weight on. I was finding that the the previous one was a little bit tight. So I retraced some of the pattern pieces. I filmed the process for you guys and altering so that you can work out the size of the collar stand that you're going to need if you want to put on a different collar like I have, how to 
put in a yoke and remove the box pleat at the back and how to extend the button placket down the front so that the dress fully opens up and has uh, buttons all the way up and down as the closure method. I did all those things and then made this one which is a viscose marocaine from the the fabric room i absolutely love how this has come out really really love it as you guys know i am not usually a fan of solid dresses but this one has just come out so so well it was my first time putting the long sleeves on this dress the options are sleeveless short sleeved or these long sleeves and it was also my first time doing the continuous lap i really really like how this came out and i've worn this quite frequently my only complaint with this dress is the viscose marocaine crinkles the minute you look at it so you have to iron it before i don't know if you can see the skirt but yeah it needs a little bit of ironing or at least steaming before it gets worn. But this was my wearable muslin before I cut into this fabric because this was three pounds a meter and this was 15 pounds a meter. This one was a present from Wilson for Christmas, which is absolutely lovely, but it's still really expensive fabric. So I didn't want to make a mess with it. So once I'd worked out that, yes, I do in fact like this dress. I think it looked great on me and I want to make it up in this fabric. I then filmed the process of making this dress from start to finish, finding your pattern size, tracing out your pattern, doing the alteration, then cutting everything out then making it from start through to finish I love how this has turned out I am going to make another one of these I really like the bodice of this dress I prefer it fully buttoned up which is unusual because I don't really like dresses to be buttoned up all the way to the top I have found that the types of shirt dresses that I prefer are the ones with the notched collars or the revere collars with a v-neck but i do really like how this one has turned out and i think i will make no i will make another one but it's going to be a long sleeved one because i don't think i would ever wear this dress buttoned all the way up sleeveless or short sleeved so i think this is always going to be an autumn winter style dress for me it's quite nice because the sleeves are quite roomy so i can definitely get another layer under here like a thermal for warmth which is going to be great in the really colder months but yeah i think i just think it's beautiful i love the skirt the skirt is kind of fitted over the, not fitted but more fitted over the hips and then flares out from just below the hips so there's some beautiful movement and swish in the skirt i really like the details on the bodice i have obviously used very busy prints so you can't really see these little details but you could either do this in a stripe fabric which would look amazing if you did these details the button placket the collar and the cuffs in a stripe like coordinating stripe with your floral so 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 pretty there's loads of those kinds of dresses going around at the moment and i'm finding real inspiration looking through like karen millen and netta porter and matches.com and stuff uh, adding a stripe in would be good adding in a solid that works really well with your fabric would be good i did consider doing these details the button plackets collar and cuffs in a solid green but the green that i had was this one and it's it's too light it wouldn't have looked right it would have needed to be this background deep green and i wouldn't have trusted buying that online because of the differences between screen colors and the actual color of the fabric when it arrives also a kind of like one of these terracotta rusty colors would have looked really nice as those details as well the other thing you could do is add piping across here if you wanted to that would look really nice as well the original collar on the dress does have the this detail kind of mirrored into it it's pieced obviously this is the collar from the 6696 so it doesn't have that detail but i can't see why i couldn't like splice that on and add that in and i think again that could be quite mm -hmm. a fun detail to add especially now that i've realized that wearing this done up all the way up to the top is how i would prefer to wear this dress i think you can tell i really really like this dress i have made a lot of changes to it but all those changes have made it into something that i really really like so if you would like to make your own let's get started the very first thing i have done is iron my tissue paper flat which will help me get an accurate trace later on the next thing that i have done is i have gone through the pattern instructions and i've made a note of all the different pattern pieces that i want to trace so i know that i am only ever going to make this skirt because the pattern size that i have the skirt the, the straight skirt doesn't fit me for a start it only goes up to a 41 inch finished hip measurement and i don't enjoy wearing that kind of dress i like this kind of dress i do know that i am going to want to be able to make it sleeveless short sleeved and long sleeved 
So I have gone through and written down all of the numbers for everything I need, excluding the two pencil skirt pattern pieces, 11 and 12, and the pocket piece, 13, that goes with these pencil skirt pattern pieces because there is a separate pocket piece that goes with the skirt because the skirt flares out. So I have got numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Now I like to write these down and then cross them off as I trace them out so that I don't miss any pieces. Ask me how I know. Now the next thing that we need to do is work out what size I need to trace. So according to the pattern envelope, I would need a size 16 for the bust, 38 inches. I would need a size 14 for the waist, which is 28 inches. I'm between 27 and 28 at the moment, but um, the 14 would be the best bet for me. And then for the hips, I'd need the size 20 for a 44 inch hip. Now I've got the pattern bundle that goes from size six to size 14. And I buy that for a reason, because I know they will add a lot of wearing ease into these pattern pieces. The size 14 on here is a, for a 36 inch bust. The finished garment measurements are on pattern piece number one. And the size 14 for a 36 inch bust gives you a finished garment measurement of 39 inches, which is three inches of wearing ease. The size 14 for the 28 inch waist gives you a finished measurement of 30 and a half inches, which is an inch and a half of wearing ease, which is much more like it in my opinion. So I'm going to trace the size 14 straight for the entirety of this dress because the measurement for the hips is on here too and the size 14 for the hips gives you a finished measurement for the full skirt of 52 inches which will more than an hour allow for my big butt. So I am going to go through and trace a straight size 14 for all of the pieces, which makes life very, very easy. I have made this dress before and I did a size 14 at the bust graded down to a 12 at the waist. And the 12 is a finished measurement of 28 and a half inches, which some days would fit me really well and some days would actually be too tight. So I'm going to err on the side of caution and do the size 14 for a 30 and a half inch finished measurement. The other thing as well is I can always nip the side seams in if I want or need to at a later date. So I'm going to get all my pattern pieces traced off and as I say I'm going to cross them off as I have traced them and then I'm going to start playing around and altering them because there's quite a few things that I want to do. I don't personally like the way that the collar goes in so I do like the trim on the collar but I don't like how the collar goes in so I'm actually going to steal the collar from the 6696. I don't like the way that the button placket finishes at hip level. I prefer it to go all the way down to the front so I'm going to do that. I also would prefer the back of the dress to have a yoke in it because that is a feature that I like about shirt dresses and this is a shirt dress. So I'm going to do all those changes but I will show you how I do those once we have traced everything off. Okay I've got all my pattern pieces cut out. Some of these will need altering and some of these won't. So my armhole facing and my short sleeve are fine. I haven't cut out my front band and that will need altering, but I've left it still in intact on its piece of paper because I'm gonna lengthen it. We've got the skirt side back, which is fine. We've got the skirt side front, which is fine. And we've got the skirt back, which is fine. They, none of those need anything doing to them. I did cut out the two piece Collar, which I think goes together like that. I don't like just um, fold over collars like this without a collar stand. I have traced this out because you never know at some time in the future I may change my mind, but I'm going to put this one to the side and I will need to trace out the 6696 collar stand and collar to go onto this dress. So next we've got the long sleeve here, which I will need to add some length to. Then we have the sleeve cuff and the continuous lap for the sleeve here. These two are fine. This one does need some length adding to it. I've got the pocket piece here for the full skirt. This doesn't need altering. I'm not gonna, I'm making my next couple of these out of viscose, so I won't include pockets because I don't like how that affects the fabric. But if I ever made this out of a cotton lawn, for example, I would use the pocket. So I'm gonna put that to the side. Next, we've got the front bodice pieces. So the front yoke is fine as it is. The 
front inset band is fine as it is. Neither of those need anything doing to them, but I will need to add length to the front bodice. I'm going to add length to the back bodice. I'm also going to do a really small sway back adjustment to this. I also want to add a yoke detail to the top of this. And then the skirt front, as you can see there, has the little notch in it for where the front band goes into the dress. And I'm going to take off this seam allowance here and extend the front band to go all the way to the hem because again that's a preference of mine follow along with me you're going to need your skirt front your bodice back your lower bodice front and your long sleeve if you need to add length to your sleeve okay i've come back down to um start manipulating the pattern pieces for the sew along and this is the sleeve and i did say i was going to add some length to the sleeve but i've held it up to my shoulder and there is going to be a cuff on the bottom of this as well and you want to bear in mind that there's seam allowances as well but i think this is actually a pretty good length as is and i'm not going to add any length to the sleeve pattern and that's a good way of kind of getting a rough idea is literally holding your pattern pieces up to you and seeing how they look on your body uh, obviously some pattern pieces it's easier to do than others the sleeve yes the darts and the bust things not so much but um yeah i've decided i'm not going to add any length to the long sleeve as is and we'll see how that works out okay so if you've watched any of my sew alongs before you know that i genuinely have to add length to the bodice of my dresses because i have a long torso so i have the front bottom bodice because there is a upper yoke piece as well but I don't need to do anything to that and then I have the back bodice here and I'm going to add an inch of length to both of these along the length and the shorten line which was on the pattern piece so I have transferred that over and I'll show you how I do that then I can start doing the other alterations that I want to get done to the back bodice so I know I need to add an inch of length so I am going to draw myself an open-ended rectangle that is one inch wide and then the important thing with the pattern piece is that you want to make sure that you have a perpendicular line going through your length and shorten line and i usually use the grain line and my grain line here isn't going all the way through the length and shorten lines so i'm just going to extend that there so i have a perpendicular line going through my length and shorten line there and that will help me to line everything up correctly when i come to stick the pattern pieces down to the spare piece of paper just realized i need some tape got my perpendicular line got my lengthen and shorten spare piece of paper i'm going to cut through the lengthen and shorten line on the pattern piece i'm going to take the bottom of the pattern piece and the line that we've just cut i'm going to line that up with the bottom of the one inch open-ended rectangle that I made. Make sure everything's lining up nicely and take that down. Then I'm going to take my pencil and I'm going to just take that perpendicular line and draw up through the one inch rectangle and that's going to help me measure, make sure that this will line up correctly. So this front edge is a straight line, so I could have used that, but I personally like to do it this way. I'm gonna take that down. Then we just need to kind of fill in the gaps, as it were. So as I say, this one is a straight line. So this one here, I'm going to put my ruler at the top mark and just draw down the whole way down like that. So just to straighten out this line here. So I can cut this out, and then I'm gonna do exactly the same for the back bodice. So I have added an inch of length to the back bodice and the front bodice and we just need to kind of join up the legs of the darts on both the front and the back which we do here. They are slightly curved but not enough to worry about at that particular point. Okay so the front bodice is now done. The back bodice 
I am going to do a very small sway back adjustment because I have found that I was getting a small amount of pooling in the back area of this dress last time I made it. However, that might have been because the waist was actually at my waist size and that was why I was getting the pooling because it wasn't quite sitting correctly. But I think I am going to do a very small sway back adjustment to this one. This is going to be my first time doing a sway back adjustment. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so for a sway back adjustment, what I'm trying to do is just take out a little bit of the kind of excess length here, but I don't want to adjust the length here. This length was good on me and it fit me fit my waist nicely. I was just getting a small piece of pooling in this area here. So what I'm going to do is take out around about half an inch because it wasn't a lot it wasn't a lot at all so I have picked a point underneath my double darts here and I've just drawn this is half an inch here down to nothing there and I'm going to cut that apart and bring that line down to meet the bottom of the wedge that I've drawn which will hopefully allow take out that back pooling um, in this area without adjusting the length of the side seam We'll then need to straighten up the, the back, so. so I've just cut, cut along the top of that wedge that I've drawn and I'm going to swing this back line down to meet the bottom line of the wedge that I've drawn. like that. So now you can see my, or can you see, hang on, okay, so if I, I've drawn a straight line so that I can bring the pattern piece top and bottom to that straight line and you can see here that this is, it's only by a couple, it's like an eighth of an inch but it's no longer straight so I need to add that back in because this is something that needs to be cut on the fold. To be fair, I mean, you could, because it's an eighth of an inch, you could just put it on the fold and it probably would be fine. But I am going to try and be a slight perfectionist about this and I am going to add that back in. I'm also going to cut the back bodice at the top here to put in a yoke because I like how yokes look. I'm going to also take out the back pleat from that yoke. So I am going to draw those lines in and then I'm going to retrace the bottom of my pattern piece rather than have to stick another piece of paper under here to straighten up this back line. I'll use the top as my yoke piece and then I'll retrace this bottom piece to uh, give myself the bottom of my back bodice because I'm going to need to add seam allowance to the top and the bottom if I'm going to put a yoke in. So let me show you what I mean by all of that. So I am going to put my yoke in just under this registration point here. So there's a small circle here which is what helps you set your sleeves in, having your armhole facing if you're not having a sleeve. So I'm going to draw in and I've got a perpendicular line here so I'm going to draw in a right angle here for my this will be my yoke I am going to leave the dart in but I am going to take take out this stitching line so we've got a line here that says center back and I am going to now make that into my cut on the fold line so I'm going to draw cut on the fold in here so we've got the center back which means I'm taking out this back pleat, this box back pleat from the back of the yoke. I do still want that in my back bodice, the lower of my back bodice. So the next thing I need to do is add on seam allowance and the seam allowance this pattern is 5 eighths of an inch. So I've drawn a line 5 eighths of an inch underneath the stitching line for my yoke. So this will now be my yoke piece. I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to cut it off along here. But before I do that, I'm going to retrace the bottom bodice piece because I'm going to need to add a seam allowance to the top of this for the bottom bodice piece so that when we put these two together we still end up with the same length of bodice that we would have had if we were cutting it in one piece. So I'm going to trace this out. Hopefully I have a piece of paper here big enough to do that. I do. And this will also mean that I can straighten out that centre back seam 
that we've made slightly wonky from doing the sway back adjustment. So I've drawn a straight line here. It is literally just an eighth of an inch of difference that I've taken out with the sway back adjustment. But as we said, we need to cut that on the fold. So we do need to take that into account. If you're doing a larger sway back adjustment, you may have to straighten that line up a little bit more. So I'm just gonna trace out the pattern piece again all the way around. I'm gonna put in all the markings and I'm then gonna add in all of the notes about all of the things that I've changed because I've changed quite a lot about this and I want to make sure that I know exactly what all those changes are. So I'm gonna put in my stitching line for my box pleat and just keep tra tracing around this pattern piece. Okay, so I've traced the new bottom back bodice piece and now I need to label it. So, I've got Vogue 9077, bodice back lower, cut one on fold to size 14. And I have one inch added to length and I've got a half inch sway back adjustment. So as you can see here this is the stitching line and then this is the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance that I've added to the top. This is the stitching line and the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance that I've added to the bottom. So when I put these two over each other the bodice will be exactly the same length. I haven't lost any length by taking out any of the uh, by, by not adding in seam allowance. So I'm going to cut this out, cut this out and I'll show you what they look like when we put them together. Okay, so I've got my back bodice over there. I'm now gonna cut out the back yoke and I'm cutting along the seam allowance that I added underneath my stitching line. And I'm also, as I mentioned, going to cut off the box pleat from the center back because I don't want there to be a box pleat on the yoke. So I'm just going to put this here. So it's the back yoke. And we actually wanna cut two of these on the fold. Okay, so now that we've got our two back pieces traced out and cut out, I'll show you what they look like together. So we've got the lower back bodice and we've got the back yoke. And if we add these together at the stitching line, we then have a back bodice piece that is exactly the same length as the one that we started with. There's obviously this piece cho chopped out here because I don't want, as I say, the box pleat going all the way up into the yoke. I only want it on the bottom half of the back bodice. But that means that our back bodice is now completely done. So we can move on to the skirt front. So the skirt front of this bodice actually has a placket that comes down to the hip level and then stops there. And you can see this in this little right angle jog that's taken out of the skirt front pattern piece. Now, I personally am not a fan of that particular finish. I like my button front dresses to go to button all the way down to the hem. It's just a personal preference of mine. So I'm going to alter this so that the placket, the button placket goes all the way down to the center front and we can do that very easily. So I've got my front band here, which I have traced out according to the pattern. And as you can see, it's only this long because it, it's meant to tie in to this part. And we obviously need to make that longer. So I've not cut that one out as yet. I've traced it on a spare piece of paper with a nice long piece underneath so that I can just continue that front band down to the hem. For the skirt piece, what we need to do is actually just take off this front allowance here because we've got our stitching line for where the placket goes in and rather than finish our placket here we want our placket to go all the way down to the hem of the skirt so I am literally going to take and it's five eighths of an inch I believe it is indeed I'm going to take five eighths of an inch straight off the remainder of the front of the skirt so draw that in all the way down to the hem and cut that off. I'm going to move my notch over so that can now go. We can get rid of that because we are going to be putting a button pocket all the way down there instead. 
So I've taken that 5 eighths of an inch off, which means we've got rid of that little right angle at the top there. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to lengthen the front band to actually be the same length as our skirt front. If you look at the skirt front, there is the dotted stitching line and it has a small circle and that small circle ties in with the small circle on the front band. So what I'm going to do is match up the small circle and that straight edge of the front band and then I can extend, make sure everything's nice and straight, I can extend the length of the front band to be the same length as the skirt front. I actually like to make my button plackets ever so slightly longer, like an inch and a half longer than the skirt fronts of my dresses, just to err on the side of caution and make sure that they definitely, definitely fit in, especially as I hem my dresses quite differently to how the pattern recommends. I'm usually hemming with bias binding, which is turning the hem up by a quarter of an inch, and the pattern usually has built in a hem of five eighths of an inch. And if you have your front band the same length as the skirt then the hem on or the seam allowance on the front band is five eighths of an inch but you're only using a quarter of an inch of your hem allowance and then you end up with your front band being too short ask me how i know so i now person again this is a personal preference of mine i personally like to make my front bands or my button plackets on shirt dresses about an inch and a half longer than they need to be so i have some wiggle room so i'm going to do the same thing for this one so now that i've worked out how long my front band piece needs to be. I can put my skirt front away. So now I know how long it needs to be, I need to work out how wide it needs to be so I can measure that. And it is three and a quarters. So I shall come down here and I will draw a line three and a quarter inches over. And then we'll do the same the whole way down. We're just gonna basically extend the pattern piece to the new length it needs to be. So once I have got the width the whole way down, I'm then going to add in the fold line. I'm also going to add in the button and buttonhole placement line. I'm going to just measure the spacing between the button and the buttonholes, which is, I think the right way around would help, two and a half inches between the bottom of one bu buttonhole and the top of the other buttonhole. So I'm just gonna add in, continue to add in that spacing the whole way along the button band. And that way we have just made our button front band long enough to fit onto the skirt right down to the hem. So gonna get that done and then I can get this cut out. Then we can have a look at the collar stand and collar from the 6696. When you are trying to work out what size collar stand and collar to trace from a separate pattern, and again, this is only if you're following along with me, you're going to need your back yoke, your front yoke, your front bodice piece, and your front band to work out the size of the neckline that you have here that your collar stand is need to, going to need to fit into. So what I've done is I've drawn in the seam allowance on each and every single one of these pieces and I have then measured from edge to edge from those seam allowances. So you can see from this point to this point, it's an inch and a half, this point to this point, two and three quarter inches. We have a dart in the back yoke, so you want to ignore that. So we've got from the seam allowance at the shoulder to the dart edge is two and a quarter. From the other side of the dart to the center back, which is cut on the fold, we've got one and a three quarters. And then for the front band, this is going to get folded in half. So this is our, folded edge so I have marked the seam allowance in here because that's where it gets sewn in and the seam allowance down from the neckline because again that's where it gets sewn in and this is the front edge which is where the front band will stop and this is an inch and a quarter so we're going to add all of those together and times that by two then you want to take the pattern that you are going to steal the collar stand from for me I use the McCall's 6696 and you're going to do the same thing you're going to draw in your seam allowance along this bottom edge and you are going to work out what that length is and you need it to correspond to this length that you have found when you have measured all of these pieces. So this is nine inches the whole way around, which means it's gonna be 18 inches when finished. And from this point to this point, is 18 inches. 
before you trace yours out you are going to want to as I say work out the length of the piece that you're going to be sewing this to. So from seam allowance to seam allowance on my collar stand is 18 inches which is the exact measurement if my pieces weren't escaping from me that the neckline ends up being when you take into account all of these pieces that get sewn together and obviously this is half of it so you double it. I hope that makes sense. As ever with every single sew along that I do I'm jumping around all over the place and to start with we are going to start on step 43. This is going to be sewing the skirt panels together and I'm doing it this way because this skirt will drop on the bias so I like to get my skirts that are going to drop sewn up first so I can hang them up and let them do their thing for as long as possible so that when I come to level the hem of the dress hopefully it won't need to be left for another week once it's finished. So the first step is 43 reinforce skirt front along a stitch line pivoting at small circle as shown clip to small circle. We're actually not going to do that because if you're following along with me I have completely eliminated that front join. We are going to be putting the button band from the neckline right down to the hem of the skirt so we can ignore step 43 and step 44. So we're going to move on to step 45 which is stitch skirt front sections to skirt front. Basically we are going to be there are two skirt fronts, two skirt side fronts, two skirt backs and two skirt side backs. So we're going to be sewing those all together matching up the notches. I don't like pockets in viscose. I find that if I use them it just drags the fabric down so I'm going to be skipping the pocket, pocket section. If you are putting pockets into your dress there is a handy tutorial up here which will teach you how to French seam a pocket into a side seam. I am going to be French seaming all of the seams on my skirt. So I'm going to start by sewing the skirt side fronts to the skirt fronts, then move on to skirt side backs to the skirt backs, and then sew the centre back seam, then sew the side seams. As I mentioned, I am French seaming all of these seams, so I have the panels pinned together wrong sides together, and I'm going to sew at a quarter of an inch. Then I will trim, press, and re sew at three eighths of an inch. That will give me a finished French seam, and I'm working with a pattern with a five eighths of an inch seam allowance. So all of the pieces get put together wrong sides together first and sewn with a quarter of an inch. Okay, so I have all of my skirt pieces sewn together at a quarter of an inch with the wrong sides together, and I'm now going to go over each of those seams and trim them down to one eighth of an inch or just under so that I can then press everything right sides together to finish the French seam and make sure everything is nice and neat and gets enclosed. So I need to cut off the excess of every single one of those seams that I've just sewn and I do prefer to do my French seams in this manner where I do all of the first step and then move on to all of the next step, the trimming, and then move on to the pressing and then the sewing. So I'm not having to do all the individual processes for each seam at a time. I do the whole like batch sewing as it were. So I'm gonna go through and trim off all the excess. Okay, so I have pressed my seams with the right sides together and I'm now gonna sew these at three eighths of an inch or just under because I'm working with a five eighths of an inch seam allowance. So the quarter of an inch then trimming, then turning, and then just under three eighths of an inch will give me if will, will have used up that full five eighths of an inch and give me a nice finish on the inside, and then also obviously not pressed yet, but a nice finish on the outside as well. So I'm halfway around the skirt. I'm going to carry on sewing these three eighths of an inch just under seams. Then I'm going to press everything. I'm going to press the side seams forward. The rest of the seams doesn't matter, but the side seams will need to be pressed forward so that they can nest with the side seams of the bodice when we attach the skirt to the bodice later. So I have sewn all of the seams with French seams, I have pressed them all and I've attached it to a pinchy pinchy hanger because I'm going to hang this up so that it can drop on the bias and when I come to level the hem hopefully it will have had a head start on the rest of the dress. So I'm going to get this hung up and then we can start working on the bodice. We are going to start at the beginning and start with the bodice. I am not going to interface my pieces as yet because I have some special requirements for the collar stand and collar for mine so I'm going to show you how they go when I put them together. We're also not going to reinforce the little dot at the top 
top of the front of the bodice because we are not putting our collar on in the same method that the pattern would suggest. So moving on to step number three, on outside stitch dart in front, press towards center. I don't like how the darts look when they are pressed and sewn on the outside of the garment. It's just not a preference of mine. So I'm gonna sew mine in the usual manner, which means that I will put the dart fullness on the inside of the garment. So I'm gonna get that marked on and sewn in and I'll show you how I transfer the markings over now. Okay, so I have already snipped into my notches at the sides and I have snipped into the bottom of my dart, but I'm going to lay my pattern piece and try and get it into the right shape. I'm going to lay my pattern piece Okay, so I have my pattern on top of my front bodice and I am going to mark the point of the dart. I've made a hole through the pattern. And I'm using my friction pen to mark that point on the fabric. Then I'm going to take my French curve and I'm actually gonna put the French curve on top of the dart because these darts are slightly curved. And I'm just gonna sort of adjust the curve of my French curve until I get the get it all to align so it's looking like that will give me the correct curve so I've got 36 at the top and 16 and a half at the bottom and this is centimeters so I'll take the pattern piece away I will line up the 36 point with the dot that I made through the pattern and then the 16 and a half point with the clip at the bottom of my dart that I made earlier and I'm going to draw that in then flip it over and do exactly the same thing on the other side the 16 and a half point matched up with the notch the little clip at the bottom 36 at the top and draw that in. I'm using a friction pen. These do go away with heat, but you wanna make sure that your fabric doesn't end up with little white marks on it because some fabrics will hold onto the friction pen and even when you iron it away, you can end up with white marks on the fabric. It's not so much of a problem on the inside, where I'm marking the darts this time, but you wanna make sure that if you are using a friction pen on the outside of your fabric, that it doesn't leave a mark when it's ironed away. So test it on a scrap piece of fabric first. So I'm gonna mark my dart on my other front bodice. I'm also gonna do the same for the back bodice pieces and also the back yoke pieces. And if you're following along with me, you should have two back yoke pieces to put darts into. So I'm gonna mark all the darts on, then I can pin them all and sew them all. Okay, so I have sewn the darts in the back, in the front pieces, and in the two yokes. So when I sew a dart, I backstitch at the beginning. I will sew up the line that I've marked and I'll sew off of the point. I don't wanna backstitch at the point because I don't want to add bulk in that area. So I leave nice long thread tails and I then knot those. And again, you wanna knot it firmly, but you don't wanna pull it too tight because you don't wanna distort the tip of the dart. So I am going to tie three knots into the thread tails of all my darts and then trim off the excess. And we're gonna be pressing our darts towards the center. We have sewn the darts to the inside of our bodice again it's just a personal preference of mine if you do want to sew your darts on the outside sew them in the manner that I've talked about so backstitch at the bottom and then sew off of the point you want to take the thread tail that you've made and you want to thread it onto a needle bring it through to the wrong side of the fabric very carefully through the point of your dart then you want to tie it in a knot on the inside so you still end up with the same finish and it, you won't have any bulk at the point of your dart so the next step is number four, fold front inset band 
on fold line and press and the front inset band is the piece that looks like this and once they're pressed wrong sides together you should end up with two pieces that look like that my knee pressing again they've been crumpled overnight the next part of step four is to base the raw edges together now my fabric behaves itself so I'm not going to worry about that but if you have a, sli a slipperier fabric you want to baste this edge here the long edge and up to the point you want to base those shut within the seam allowance so step five is pin front inset band to front matching circles and baste so I haven't pressed my darts as yet because I haven't crossed any seams when I'm sewing so I am going to get as much done as I can at the sewing machine before I get up to press but we want to insert our band into the front bodice and so you've got the pointed end on the side seam and then the kind of curved end goes into the neckline and they should fit perfectly there is also a notch to match up there now you want to have a look at it and decide which side of the band you prefer I think this side's quite busy so I'm actually going to go for the less busy side and then the other side of this one isn't as busy as well so it's going to look quite nice so the busier side will give you kind of like a more obvious breakup in the pattern but depending on the look that you want just pick the side that you prefer up and so we're laying it onto the right side of the bodice and again it says to baste it in place I'm actually going to just pin mine into place and again because my fabric is is a nice well-behaved rayon so I don't need to worry too much about everything slipping out of place so the next step is number six with right sides together pin your yoke front to yoke matching circles stitch press seam allowance towards the yoke so the yoke piece is this piece here that looks like that now I'm going to French seam this you will need to make a judgment call on the width of your like the, the the sturdiness of your fabric if it's a thicker fabric you might want to just sew this with a regular seam and then bind the inside or overlock or pink whichever is your preference I'm using a really thin fabric so I am going to French seam mine which means that I need to take my yoke piece to the other side and I am going to pin these together wrong sides together so I'm going to get that all pinned into place behaving itself and I'll show you what that looks like when I'm done so I thought I would show you what these pieces look like pinned we have the front decorative band here and then the yoke piece the top yoke piece is pinned wrong sides together with the front bodice and so this is what both pieces look like you will end up with a little bit of overhang from the yoke piece that's totally fine so we're going to sew this with a quarter of an inch seam trim press and sew it again at three eighths of an inch to enclose all the raw edges again this is only going to work because i'm using a really lightweight fabric if you're using a heavier fabric like my first dress that i made from this which was a polyester twill then you will want to bind the edge of this with bias binding or pink the seam or overlock it on the inside but this is really lightweight so i can get away with a french seam which is great because we all know how much i like a french seam so i'm going to get these sewn and i'll show you what that looks like i have sewn that line of stitching there at a quarter of an inch so i now need to trim that seam down to just under an eighth of an inch so that i can press it with the right sides together which will allow me to then sew the final part of the French seam at just under three eighths of an inch and that will enclose all of this raw edge give me a nice finish on the inside and the outside and as you can probably imagine I am going to be French seaming most of the seams in this dress again if you have a heavier weight fabric you can use bias binding you can use overlocker you can pink your edges you can overcast your edges with a zigzag stitch on your machine if you don't have an overlocker my personal preference is French seaming I just really like how it looks on the inside so whilst I am up at the ironing board pressing these seams I'm also going to press all of the darts and as I mentioned we are pressing all of the darts 
into the center. So the, um, the bodice darts are going to be towards the front, the back darts are going to be towards the center back, and the yoke darts are going to be towards the center back. If you're following along with me and have cut two yokes and you have a heavier weight fabric, you might want to press your yoke darts in opposing directions so that the lining goes one way and the outer goes the other way so they nest nicely. But again, I'm using quite a lightweight fabric so I should be fine pressing both of mine towards the center. Okay, so I have two finished front panels here. So once I had trimmed off the excess, I went and pressed it so that the right sides were together. I then sewed at three eighths of an inch to enclose the raw edge and I've pressed the seam towards the yoke. I now have a nicely finished inside and the panels here I think you can just see are beautifully finished on the inside and now we can treat these as a single piece. So now that we have our front pieces done we can put those to the side. Next up is step number seven on outside stitch waist darts in back press towards center. As you know we've already sewn all of the darts I like to do one process in bulk so I have sewn all my darts as well. I have also sewn the darts for mine on the inside. What's interesting is that they would have you sew the neck darts on the inside but the waist darts on the outside. Again if you want to sew your darts on the outside it's totally up to you. Do it the same way that I mentioned earlier, back stitch at the start, sew off at the point, thread the thread tails onto a needle, bring it through to the wrong side and tie it in a knot carefully so you don't end up with super pointy darts at the end. I've separated my pattern pieces because I have added a yoke, it's a preference of mine. So I have sewn the darts into my yoke pieces and I have two of those so I've sewn four neck darts in total again same manner so now we're moving on to step number nine to make pleat in back on outside bring stitching lines together matching upper and lower large circles based stitch along stitching line the way that I've done this is I have actually just cut into the bottom of my stitching line and just cut notches in there. So I am going to match up my notches on the bottom and the top of my pattern piece. I am going to make sure that the center back edge here is nice and straight. I'm then going to take my ruler and I'm going to match up those two notches with my chalk pen because I don't want to put friction pen on the outside of this because it does show up with a white residue on the outside when it's been pressed. So I'm going to use my chalk pen to mark that line, put some more pins in and then I will stitch that down. That does save me having to baste it into place but again that's completely up to you. If you want to baste in your stitching lines then put them together, pin them together, then sew. Again depending on how slippery your fabric is that is the option that the pattern would recommend. Okay so I have sewn the line of stitching on the outside so we had the wrong sides together. Now the next thing you need to do is take this to the ironing board and we need to flatten out this box pleat so that there's an even amount to each side of the stitching. So you want to flatten it out and you'll end up with something like this which we will then baste the top and the bottom into place. And I am going to baste this because despite the fact this fabric presses really well and stays in place we are going to be manhandling it quite a lot in a minute to burrito the yolks into place. So I want to make sure that it's definitely going to stay where I put it. So I'm going to go and press this box pleat flat with an even amount to each side of the stitching to get that look, base them into place, and then we can move on to sewing the yokes on and the shoulder seams. You should end up with something that looks like this. So we've got our back pleat there. Now, again, this, this part isn't in the instructions because I have added a yoke. So if you followed along with me, you should now have to sew the top part of your back bodice on. Now this is the one that I'm going to use for the outer. I did cut both yokes out of the same fabric. So if you have done the same, you want to kind of audition and see which one you prefer. And I think I prefer that one. I couldn't tell you why. I really couldn't tell you why. Do I prefer that one or do I prefer this one? I don't know, I think I might have to get mum to come and help me have a look. I can't, I just stop here. Oh, I'm okay. Mid. You're a mid thing. Hang on. <laughs> we'll be right back. Mid trace. So, do you prefer 
this combination mm -hmm. or Ooh. that combination. See, that one actually has that and that echo, and that and that echoed, which I'm not sure I like. They're right. Because I did think I did, but then I thought maybe this one actually might look a bit better. And that kind of... Yeah, kind goes of goes together. As does that and this, and then it's not the same. It's that flower yeah, yeah, down yeah. there. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. I think yeah. that one... It's more interesting somehow. Yeah, I think so. And this, this like I say, is kind of like a much closer repeat of yeah. what's on the thing. The only thing is that one you've got the... Yeah, it doesn't matter, it's on the back and it'll be under my hair. Yeah. Right, okay, so now, now that I... <laughs> now that we've decided which one's going to be our outer, I'm going to fold this over and if you followed along with me for the pattern making part of this, this should fit perfectly. So I'm going to pin the yoke that I want to be visible right sides together with the back panel and then I'm going to pin the other yoke onto the inside and I'll show you what that looks like when I've done it. Okay, so I have the yoke that I've picked for the outside pinned right sides together with the back bodice and then I have the interior yoke with the right side of the yoke to the wrong side of the bodice pinned into place. So I'm basically sandwiching the back bodice between the two yolks. So I'm going to sew at five eighths of an inch and then I'm going to press both yolks up. I have got my yolks attached and pressed up so that they're nicely finished on the inside and the outside. Again, it's just a preference of mine. I really like how yolks look on shirt dresses, plus I get to burrito something and I always like that method, which is what I'm going to show you now. So the next step on the pattern is to do step 11, stitch back to front sections at shoulder seams and sides. We are going to burrito the yoke, so we'll have a nicely clean finished shoulder seams on the inside of our garment. So I'm gonna show you how we do that. I'm gonna take my back piece and I'm going to make sure that the inner yoke is out of the way. So I've just folded the inner yoke down so we are just working with the outer layer of our back panel. We're going to take our front panels and we are going to lay them right sides together so that the shoulder seams match up and we're going to pin those into place and we're going to sew those at 5 8 of an inch. So I've sewn the front of the bodice to the back of the bodice at the shoulder seams and now comes the burrito method. So I am going to roll up the front and back bodice together from the bottom edge and as we roll we should start to reveal the underneath yoke just like that. So I'm going to take the shoulder seams of the yoke, bring them over and pin them into place with the previously sewn shoulder seams. I'm going to pin them into place and then once they're pinned I'm going to sew along that previous line of stitching to make sure that everything matches up nice and neatly. Then we can gently pull the bodice through the neckline and we will have beautifully finished shoulder seams and center uh, yoke seam. Everything will be nicely enclosed. Then we can sew the side seams with a French seam. So I'm going to get this pinned into place, sew along that line of stitching and then I will show you what it looks like when we come to turn it through. Okay, so once you've sewn your second line of stitching at the shoulder seams you should end up with something like this. It's a little burrito, that's where the name comes from. So, very gently, because you don't want to stretch anything out, you're going to reach inside the neckline and you're going to gently pull the bodice through. Very gently. That was my stomach. And you should end up with something, hopefully, that will unroll and you will have cleanly finished shoulder seams on the inside and the exterior. So I'm going to go and press these and then we can sew the side seams together with a French seam. So I'm going to sew my side seams with a French seam which means I have pinned my side seams wrong sides together and I'm going to sew at a quarter of an inch down here. When you're doing this you want to make sure that you are catching this bat, this de decorative band, you want to make sure you're properly catching that into the seam and that it's all lying nice and flat. So I'm going to sew both side seams at a quarter of an inch 
trim press so at three eighths of an inch press and then we are done with our bodice i have sewn these side seams together at a quarter of an inch and i'm now trimming off the excess so that the seam allowance is just under an eighth of an inch then i'm going to go and press it with the wrong sides together so i can sew at three eighths of an inch to finish off the french seam i have finished off the side seams with french seams so the insides have been sewn at three eighths of an inch and i've pressed these towards the back and if you remember earlier when we did the skirt we pressed the side seams of the skirt towards Towards the front which means we'll be able to nest these seams when we sew those together because I am of course going to French seam the waist seam. So I'm going to put this to the side for now and we can start working on the sleeves. We're going to skip past the armhole facing because ours have got sleeves, we're going to skip past the short sleeve pieces and we're going to move on to step 25 for view C. Edge, e stitch the upper edges of the sleeves between the notches so from the double notch at the back to the single notch at the front, we're going to run two lines of gathering stitches, three eighths of an inch away from the raw edge, and then three eighths of an inch away from that. As ever, that will put my visible stitching into the garment because I like my stitching line to be between my two lines of gathering stitches. I find it gives the nicest kind of look not that these are ease stitches it's not that we're going to gather the top of this sleeve cap in we're going to ease it in but i still prefer to have a line of the ease stitching either side of my actual stitching line then we are going to reinforce lower edge of sleeve along stitching line pivoting at small circle slash between the stitching to upper end so this is where we're going to put in the continuous lap for the cuff to be attached to so that you can get your arm in and out of your sleeve so i'm going to get all of that done and i'll show you what it looks like when I'm finished. Okay, so I've put my E stitching in from notch to notch on the sleeve cap, and then I have st stitched up my stitching line. Now we're going to snip up the center of the stitching line right to the top, but not through the stitching. And then we are going to take our continuous lap piece, which is piece number nine, and they look like this. And you're going to press in one of the edges, just one, by a quarter of an inch so you end up with two pieces look, that look like this. Once we've done that you are going to place them with right sides together, pin the continuous lap to sleeve matching the small circles, placing remaining quarter inch seam line along stitching stitch. In the centre of our continuous lap there are small circles and those small circles are going to be what correspond with the top of the stitching line that we've put in earlier. I'm going to snip up to but not through this and then it will be the right sides together of the unpressed edge we're going to try and sew to that seam allowance that we're going to create by, by opening up this line here. Hopefully that makes sense. So the stitching line that we've done previously is our guide for stitching this on. I've got the right sides together and the unfolded side, the raw edge matching up with the raw edge we've created by splitting up that stitching line in the sleeve. I've pinned both ends but I'm not pinning anything else. I'm kind of just doing this um, by maneuvering things and going slowly. So as I say this is the stitching line and when we get to the centre here we actually want to maintain the quarter inch seam allowance on the continuous lap, but not on the actual sleeve itself. So it's going to end up looking a little bit like this. And the idea is that we want to sew over this point so that it's secured with a quarter of an inch seam allowance from the small circle here to the edge of the continuous lap. As I mentioned, I find this easier unpinned because it's I find it easier to manoeuvre but you need to work out which way works best for you. Personally I prefer to do this unpinned. I have pinned the two edges to start but once I've got going I take that pin out and I'm just leaving this one in so there's a little bit of behaviour from the continuous lap under there but I find that I end up with more manoeuvrability and that the pins can sometimes distort the fabric when you pin them in so I am going to continue sewing this and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. Okay so step 28 is to press the seam towards continuous lap, turn pressed edge of continuous lap to inside over seam and slip stitch into, pre into place and press. After all that sewing we should end up with something that looks like this. So we need to, as it says, press this seam towards the continuous lap and then once those seams are pressed we are then going to take the continuous lap and bring it over to cover that raw edge up to the line of stitching that we've done and we're going to press that into place 
and then we're going to slip stitch this edge the folded edge down on the inside to finish that off if you want to you can top stitch this i'm not doing any visible top stitching on this dress but that would would look really really nice especially on the details on the bodice the the, the band details on the bodice so depending on what type of finish you want you can do a lot of top stitching for this shirt dress but for me for this time i am going to follow the instructions and slip stitch everything on the inside so that there's no visible top stitching on the outside so i'm going to press those seams that we've just sewn towards the continuous lap press the continuous lap over to cover the raw edges and then i am going to slip stitch that into place i'm going to do that for both sleeves okay it is very fiddly but it is doable so i have slip stitched everything into place and you want to press it so that the short end is pressed flat and then the longer end you want to turn that under so it's turned under there and you're going to press that on top of the shorter end and press it flat like that and that will give you a nicely finished gap for you to get your cuff onto and then obviously your hand in and out of your sleeve. So the next thing that we need to do is put in our pleats into our sleeve. So if you get your pattern piece out you can see that there are small circles and large circles and the arrows are going towards the large circles. So we are going to be pleating our fabric towards the large circles and toward, from the large side towards the continuous lap that we've just put in. The way that I like to do my pleats is I will snip into the leg of the pleat. So we're pleating towards the continuous lap that we've just done. So I have got notches in the legs of all of my pleats. So I'm going to take the second notch and bring it over to the first notch and line those up and put a pin in it. And then I'm going to bring the fourth notch over to the third notch and line those up and put a pin in it. So you should end up with something that looks like that. So we've got two pleats pleating towards the continuous lap. So I'm gonna do the same for the other side. And then we are actually gonna base these into place. So again, I have the continuous lap on the short piece pressed flat, and then the continuous lap on the wider piece pressed under, and then those are pressed on top of each other to give a nice finish. And then we've got four notches along the bottom edge here. So I'm gonna take the second notch, fold it, and bring it over towards the first notch. And we wanna make sure that the raw edges are aligned. And I'm gonna pin that into place. And then I'm gonna take the fourth notch and bring that over to the third notch. and pin that one into place. Now the pattern does say that you can baste up the edges of these pleats but I personally don't like to do that because we're going to remove that stitching at later date anyway, you're not sewing these pleats down. So I'm just going to baste across the bottom edge here making sure that the raw edges are all nice and aligned. I'm going to baste at 3 8 of an inch then we can sew up the side seams of our sleeves. We should end up with two prepared sleeves that have the pleats and then the continuous lap. The next step is number 31, stitch sleeve seam. Of course, we will be doing this with a French seam. This is me we're talking about. So we want to bring the two edges of the sleeve seam together, wrong sides together. We're gonna to stitch that at a quarter of an inch, trim, press, and then stitch at three eighths of an inch and press towards the front so that we can nest it with the bodice seam. That will complete the French seams for the sleeves. So I'll show you what that looks like as we go. I have sewn the seam at a quarter of an inch and I'm now trimming it down so that it is less than an eighth of an inch so that I can press it right sides together and then do the final three eighths of an inch seam 
to enclose all the raw edges and finish off the French seam. As I mentioned, I am going to press this seam towards the front. The side seam that this will correspond to on the bodice has been pressed towards the back and I want these to nest nicely because I shall be French seaming the sleeves in. So the seam for these ones will get pressed towards the front. Okay, so now the sleeves are done, we're going to work on the cuffs. So we, step 32 is turn the 5 8 of an inch seam allowance on unnotched edge of cuff in, press, and then trim the seam allowance down to 3 8 of an inch. I've interfaced my cuffs and I have pressed under the edge by 5 8 of an inch. I have actually had a look at my cuff and decided which one I want to be my outer and it will be the edge that's not been pressed under that is going to be the outer cuff. It's not technically the, un the notched edge but this is a rectangle so whichever side you like best can be the outer cuff. So I've done that for both of them. The next thing we need to do is step 33, pin cuff to sleeve, placing square at the underarm seam and large circles at the opening edges as shown. Stitch, trim, press seam towards cuff. So this is the underarm seam here and we are going to need to mark that on our cuffs. We've got the underarm seam there put in the notch and then these large circles will go to either side of the continuous lap. So I'll get it pinned into place and show you what it looks like. Okay so I have the right side of the cuff to the right side of the sleeve. I have matched up the notch, I've matched up the square with the underarm seam, then the large circles are 5 eighths of an inch away from the edge of the cuff and they get matched up with the continuous lap and you will end up with 5 eighths of an inch hanging over the edge this is what you want this is the longest this is sorry this is the shorter side of the cuff and the continuous lap is flat there on the longer side of the cuff where the pleats are the continuous lap should be folded back towards the interior of the sleeve so we've got the continuous lap folded in there and again we have 5 eighths of an inch hanging over the edge so I'm going to sew along this pinned line at 5 eighths of an inch and then I'm going to press the cuff down and the seam allowance into the cuff. So once you have sewn the cuff to the sleeve you want to trim the seam allowance down. I'm trimming down to mine to a quarter of an inch. I'm going to do the same with the 5 8 of an inch that I've trimmed here. I'm going to trim this down to 3 8 of an inch um, just so that they're reducing the bulk in the cuff when it's all put together. So I'm going to get the seam allowance trimmed off. I'm going to press the cuff up away from the sleeve and I'm going to press the seam allowance into the cuff. Next we have step 34, with right sides together, fold cuff along fold line, stitch ends and trim. So you want to end up with something that looks like this. So we've got the two turned under ends of the raw edges of all the long edges of our cuffs turned under and pinned together and pinned to the fold and we're going to sew at 5 8 of an inch down this end, back stitching at the beginning and the end and we're going to do that for both sides and the important thing is to make sure that the raw edges are turned under and the folded edges are meeting up. So I'm going to get that stitched, we'll then trim off the excess from the corner and the excess seam allowance from here, turn it through and we can slip stitch it into place. Once you've sewn your cuff you should end up with something that looks like this and we want to trim off the excess at this bottom corner so that we can get a nice pointy corner and we want to trim off the excess seam allowance off of the entirety of the cuff. Okay, so once that's gone we can turn our cuff through You probably want to use your purple thing, purple thang, to get your points of your cuff nice and pointy. Do that for both sides. We're going to go and press this, and then you're going to pin the folded edge of your cuff that is loose. You're going to pin it along your stitching line and you're going to slip stitch that into place to close up that cuff. Again, if you are top stitching yours, if you want decorative top stitching, you can totally base this into place and then top stitch from the right, right side. I am not doing any visible top stitching on this shirt dress, so I will get this pressed, pinned and slip stitched into place. I have some lovely finished cuffs and they have the nice opening in them which allows me to French seam the sleeve seam 
and still have the opening for the cuffs so you can get your hand in and out of them. I really do like this kind of continuous lap or sometimes even the plackets that go into sleeves to do, allow you to do this rather than putting the cuff from edge to edge on the underseam. Now that we've got our sleeves finished we are going to attach them to the bodice. So for views B and C step 36 with right sides together pin sleeve into armhole placing large circle at shoulder. I always put a snip a notch in where the large circle is just so that I can match it up with the shoulder seam. Again just a preference of mine. Adjust ease, baste, stitch, stitch again quarter of an inch away in seam allowance, trim close to stitching, press seam allowance flat, turn seam towards sleeve. Okay I'm going to French seam mine. I mean that's not a surprise to any of you is it but I much prefer how the French seam finishes the garment on the inside. If you want to, you can either use bias binding, you can use the method they've described and pink the edges. You can overcast the edges on your sewing machine with a zigzag stitch if you don't have an overlocker or you can overlock, but I'm gonna French seam. We need to take our sleeve and you wanna make sure that you're putting the, the correct sleeve to the correct side. So we've got our sleeve with the wrong side out. We've got our bodice with the wrong side out. This is the sleeve for, that's the back, so that's the other side, because we've got the notches at the sleeve to, dis to tell us which one's which. So we've got the single notch there and the double notch there. The double notch is the back. So with wrong sides together, I'm gonna match up the underarm seam. And if you remember, we pressed the bodice seam towards the back and the sleeve seam towards the front. So those seams will nest nicely. And we're pinning these with wrong sides together. So I'm going to go through and match up the single notch, the double notch, the large circle with the shoulder seam. In my case, it's a, it's a notch, I just prefer to to mark my shoulder seams that way, match that up. Once those points are all matched up, I'm then going to gather the ease stitching in to ease the excess of the sleeve cap into the armhole. And I'll show you what that looks like when I've pinned it all into place. You should end up with something that looks a little bit like this. I have pinned the side seam and the under seam of the sleeve together. I've matched up the single notch and the double notch. I've matched up the shoulder seam with the notch or the large circle at the top. And then I have pulled on the E stitching and kind of just ease the fullness in. We are not going to, we are not going for gathers with this one. We're going for a nice set in sleeve with no tucks or puckers in it. So I'm going to sew with the sleeve side up under my needle and the bodice side at, by the feed dogs. I personally prefer that when I have excess fabric to ease in. I find it gives me more control. I know some people prefer to have the feed dogs work on the excess fabric to feed it in but I can't see if there are tucks and puckers forming that way around. So I'm going to sew it with the sleeve side up and the bodice side down. We're going to sew this at a quarter of an inch like we would with any other French seam that we were doing and I'm going to do one sleeve at a time. That's the other sleeve over there. So I'm going to get this done, get the other one pinned in and sewn, show you what that looks like. So you should end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Now don't worry if you have got some tucks or little puckers in that first line of stitching. They are going to get evened out when we trim this turn it, press it, and then sew this next line of stitching. So we need to trim our seam allowance down from the quarter of an inch that we've sewn to one eighth of an inch or just under, like we would with a usual French seam. Take your time with these bits. It is a little bit fiddly. I spent a lot of time sewing these in, sort of sewing a little bit, adjusting, taking the pins out, smoothing the fabric, moving it around a little bit. No one's going to know how long it's taken you to sew your seam once you've got your finished garment. So I'm going to trim off my excess seam allowance the whole way around so that we have one eighth of an inch left next to that stitching line that we've just put in. Then I am going to go and press my seams so that the right side of the sleeve is facing the right side of the bodice. And then we can finish our French seam with three eighths of an inch stitching line which will enclose this raw edge and give us a nicely finished sleeve. So I'm gonna get the rest of this trimmed for both sides, go and press it, sew that last seam, and I'll show you what that looks like when we get there. Okay, so 
I pressed my seam allowances with the right sides together and I have then sewn at 3 8 of an inch the entire way around. Now I need to remove the gathering stitching because there is some gathering stitching that's visible in the garment and then also the one that's in the seam allowance. Technically you don't have to remove that one if you don't want to but I like to because I just think it looks neater on the inside. So I'm just going to give myself a fairly decent sized tail and gently pull on that thread. There's one gone. And do the same for this second line of gathering stitching. Grab hold of the underneath thread. So when we turn this through we should be able to remove this outer line of gathering stitching and then if you can see we have a nicely set in sleeve with no tucks or puckers so there are a few tucks and puckers in that first line of stitching like there's one just there hopefully that's visible but when you've kind of put the e-stitching in when you're actually sewing on the 5 eighths of an inch seam, al seam allowance so your second pass at 3 eighths of an inch to do the French seam that bit will should be nice and smooth because you've eased everything in so I'm going to give the shoulder seams a little bit of a steam. I don't actually like to press my sleeve seams f too flat. I don't mind leaving them a little bit bouncy out of all the seams on the dress. They're the ones that I leave a little bit bouncy just because I prefer how that looks. But you would, you are meant to press the seam allowance flat and turn the seam towards the sleeve. So I'm just gonna remove the gathering stitching from my other sleeve head. I'm going to move all of that and then we can attach the bodice to the skirt. Okay so if you're following along with me then we are skipping from view C, B and C step 36. We've made our skirt completely. We are going to skip to step 52 with right sides together, pin skirt to front and back, matching seams and centers, clipping skirt where necessary, Stitch, stitch again quarter of an inch away in seam allowance, trim close to stitching, press seam towards front and back. Right, I'm going to French seam mine because of course I am. Again, if you are using a thicker fabric, you might want to think about perhaps binding the edges and then sewing it together. You could overlock the edges, you could pink the edges. Any of those methods will work. You can overcast on your machine as well if you don't have an overlocker. But mine is ni my fabric's nice and thin, so I am going to French seam mine together. Okay, so I have pinned the bodice to the skirt wrong sides together and you'll notice when you're pinning this together that the darts on the bodice meet up with the skirt panels seams. The side seams we press the bodice seams towards the back and the skirt seams towards the front so they should nest. Then the next skirt panel will correspond with the back darts on the bodice. The centre back seam will correspond with the centre back seam that you've sewn for your box pleat on your bodice and, and the same as we continue around to the other side. So as usual, usual with a French seam I'm going to sew this at a quarter of an inch to begin with. I'm going to sew it with the bodice side up because I want to make sure that my darts are going to, the fullness of my darts is going to lie flat, that the box pleat doesn't get caught and, and turned over or anything like that. The skirt side is actually fairly flat and well behaved on this particular dress because the fullness comes from just below the hips. So I'm going to get this sewn at a quarter of an inch and then trim, press, and so again to finish off the French seam which I will of course show you as we go. Okay, so I have sewn together the top bodice and the skirt wrong sides together at a quarter of an inch and I'm now trimming off the excess seam allowance to leave myself with just under an eighth of an inch remaining then I'm going to go and press it right sides together so that I can finish the French seam at three eighths of an inch to enclose all the raw edges. Believe it or not the skirt on this hasn't dropped on the bias and if it's not going to start dropping on the bias in 24 hours it's just not going to do it. So I'm going to put my bias binding on. I've measured the hem and it's Oh, oh gosh, was it four or f four meters twenty or f four meters forty or I five think meters? Four forty. Did I say four forty or five forty? No, four. You said. Yeah, no. I've got four meters forty of bias binding. I think my hem might be five meters forty. Let me just double check. I'm glad I double checked because the hem is five twenty, and I have four forty of binding. I did use this on a by hand London Anna 
bodice or top that I made yesterday for the back center back seam and also the neckline which I'm glad that I did because you know it, it all matched it just means that I shall use this for something else and I will grab out like a dark green possibly brown maybe even the red what do you think mum it's going to be in the hem there'll be a little flick of it seen every now and again I think the brown actually I don't know why the green's a bit too bright the red would be all right but yeah I think the brown is well. sort of disappear so I'm going to sew the brown on <laughs> okay so I have sewn the right side of the binding to the right side of the dress I'm now going to go and press it and roll it so that the binding is on the inside and I'm going to leave like a 1 16th of the fabric showing and I'm going to press that the whole way around. Once I've done that I can then get the button bands sewn on. Okay so the next step is 53 turn in seam allowance on long unnotched edge of front band press and trim pressed seam allowance to 3 eighths of an inch. Very much like we did with the cuffs. So there is a notch at the top on the left hand side of pattern piece number 19 the front band as you look at it that is the side that we will be attaching to our dress so it's this side that we're going to need to press under now before i press anything under i actually like to press my band in half and put a nice sharp crease down the front band before i do anything else to it and i find that helps me to get everything aligned and installed really nice and evenly when I come to sew it to the dress later and then slip stitch the raw edges closed once I've got it actually attached. So I'm going to put on my interfacing. There is a top end and a bottom end to this. The top end has a very, very slight curve in it, a very, very slight curve. So I have put a pin in the top edge of my actual fabric so that I remember which is the top edge because the curve is that slight but it is just something to bear in mind also you can tell which is the top because the notch is close to it but if just in case you forgot to put the notch in I like to mark the top of mine with a pin so I'm going to go and attach the interfacing press it in half press the unnotched edge under by five eighths of an inch and then trim that pressed edge down to three eighths of an inch and I'll show you what that looks like when we're done okay so we should end up with two bands that look like this and that's the bottom so it this that's the top right so we should end up with two button bands or two front bands that look like this so we've got the end pressed under this is the notched edge and then a mirror image of it here so we're now going to attach these to the front of our dress and we're going to match up the notch and then we're just going to keep pinning until we come off the end of our skirt because if you remember when I cut these out I tend to cut these out a little bit longer just to make sure that I really do have enough button band to cover the length of the dress and the skirt because of how I put things together and how I like to hem it. Again ask me how I know I um, once had to patch onto the bottom of a button band because it was too short. So I'm going to get these pinned to the dress then we can get them attached with a 5 8 of an inch seam allowance. We are doing our button bands a little bit differently to the pattern. The pattern would have you finish the top edge because of the collar that it would have you put on. I don't like the collar, I don't like the method of installing it. I think it ends up with a really weak point and I nearly scrapped this entire dress because of that the first time I made it. So I have put the raw edge up against the raw edge of the neckband. Now this means that your notches are going to be out by about 5 eighths of an inch which is what we want. So the notch on the dress will be 5 eighths of an inch lower than the notch on the button band. That's fine. So I've sewn this at 5 eighths of an inch and I am now going to go and press it so that the seam allowance is into the button band 
and the button band is facing away from the dress. I'm then going to trim the seam allowance down from the bodice of the dress and the button band and then the button band the other side as well so that when I put them together and slip stitch them there won't be too much bulk in there for when we put the buttons in. We are going to need to finish off the bottom end of our button band so I'm going to go press this and I will show you how I get a nice clean finish with the bias binding and the hem, the bottom of the button band and as you can see it's about an inch longer than the hem of the dress which is what I wanted and why I add that extra sort of like inch inch and a half when I cut my front bands button bands out because I want to make sure that I am not running out of button band at this point. So I'm going to go press the button band the front band over and I'm going to press all the seam allowance into the button band and I'm going to do that for both sides. I have pressed the button band or the front band over and I've pressed all the seam allowance into it. I've trimmed down my seam allowances on the folded over edge and the sewn edge. Okay so to neatly finish off the bottom of our button band you want to fold it so that the right sides are together and the folded edges meet up and then you want to stitch the bottom of the button band level with the stitching line of your bias binding. So we're going to stitch across there and backstitch at the folded edge to enclose the raw edges. I'm going to trim off the excess and we're also going to trim off the excess from the corner point so that when we turn this through and I'm going to use my purple thang again to get the corner nice and pointy. So we're going to turn that through and that will give us a nice clean finished edge of our button band and when we slip stitch the interior we'll slip stitch it so that the bias binding is enclosed and you should end up with something that looks like that. So I'm going to get the other side done, press that bottom edge and then I'm going to pin the interior of the button band to the dress on that folded line and I'm going to slip stitch that into place to finish that off. Again if you're doing visible top stitching you can base this into place and do visible top stitching from the right side on the button band but as you know I'm not doing any visible top stitching on this dress so I'm going to slip stitch both of those into place. It's a couple of hours later but my bands are slip stitched into place and pressed so I made sure that my folded edge hit the stitching line and then I've, I've sewn that into place. I then pressed it from this side just to make sure that I had a nice crisp edge there. So I now do. So this is a good time to try your dress on. This shirt dresses are a little bit problematic with trying things on because you kind of have to do a lot until you get to the point where you can realistically try a dress on. This is a good point because the only thing that we haven't got on here at the moment is the collar. So you want to be careful about the neckline but you can definitely try this on and make sure that the front bands overlap and that you like how it looks. I will have said this at the beginning of the video but you really should make a muslin of at least the bodice of one of these before you cut into really expensive fabric or use inexpensive fabric for the first one to make a wearable muslin if you are confident like I am with Vogue patterns that with a few minor alterations I can generally get them to fit me the way that I want. So the next thing that we need to do is prep the neckline for putting in our collar and collar stand. So I'm going to stay stitch around the entire neckline at 5 eighths of an inch which will allow me to clip into the curves to get the neckline to fit into the collar stand when I attach that. So I'm going to put some stay stitching in a half an inch the whole way around the neckline. Okay so we are going to be doing the collar and collar stand next. So there's a little bit of prep work that you need to do first. I hope you can just about see it but I have drawn in the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance on the interfacing and I'm going to trim that off and then on the under collar and under collar stand I've drawn a line 1 eighth of an inch away from the edge and I'm going to trim that off. This will help us to just make sure that the under collar rolls under, doesn't peek out, looks really nice. It doesn't matter so much if you're top stitching because you can kind of fudge it but when you're not top stitching the collar this will really help to make sure that it, it lies 
nicely so I'm gonna get all those bits trimmed off and I'll show you what that looks like so hopefully that shows it a little bit better I've trimmed off the excess seam allowance from the interfacing so I'm gonna go and put that into place obviously maintaining the seam allowance around the edges and I've kept it in the the seam allowance in the bottom edge but just taking it off around the sort of like top edges and then this is the 1 8 of an inch trimmed off of the under collar stand and the under collar I've taken that off and again that's just going to help everything to roll underneath and look really nice once we've got it all sewn so i'm going to go and get these attached and then we can start making the collar i have pinned the upper collar to the under collar you will have to stretch the under collar slightly because it is now smaller than the upper collar but that is what we want so we're going to sew a 5 8 of an inch the whole way around if you struggle to kind of like judge where the 5 8 of an inch is around the corner mark it in draw it in it's not a problem literally just kind of put on a pen mark that will give you a guide of exactly where you need to pivot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sew with a normal stitch length to about an inch away from the corner point. I'm going to reduce my stitch length to 1.5. I'm going to sew up to the corner but not quite to it. I'm going to take one diagonal stitch across the corner then continue along this line at one and a half on my stitch length for about another inch. Put it back to regular and do exactly the same for the other corner. And this should help me once I've trimmed everything and turned it through get a nice pointy point on my corner. So I'm going to get this sewn and I'll show you what it looks like okay so you should end up with something that looks a little bit like this as you can see i have trimmed the seam allowance down i have cut it very close at the corners it's another reason for lowering your stitch length so that you can trim it nice and close so that it all stays intact so i'm going to turn it through and i have my purple thang here which will help me point to get my corners nice and pointy you want to be gentle with this you don't want to push too hard because you will end up pushing whatever you're using to turn it through again ask me how I know so obviously this is going to need pressing and you want to press it with the under collar which is the uninterfaced side up because the under collar is going to roll to the inside so match up your notches and when you kind of it, when you kind of like um sort of like uh, get everything lying flat and the this raw edge all matched up the under collar is going to help the over collar roll over so you're going to press with the under collar up and you're going to make sure that everything looks nice and pointy at the corners and then we can start attaching it to the collar stand to then put it on the dress so i'm going to get this pressed then we can move on to the next step this is the outer collar and this is the under collar and I think you can just about see that the outer collar is slightly visible on the underneath but the raw edges are matching up and that's what we want to aim for so I am going to set this aside for now and the next thing that we're going to do is attach our interfaced under collar to our neckline now obviously these are come from different patterns so the notches aren't going to line up so what i've done is i have made a notch in the center of the the center back of the dress and the center back of the collar i have then made sure that my under collar is overlapping by five eighths of an inch past the button bands and I've done that on both sides and then I have eased the rest of my under collar into the neckline. Now you understitched the neckline earlier and if you need to snip into and up to the understitching to get the collar to lie flat for you that's what you need to do. So I'm going to sew this on at 5 eighths of an inch then I'm going to press the under collar up with the seam allowance into the under collar. So I'm going to get that sewn on and I'll show you what that looks like. I have got the collar stand on and I have pressed everything up into the neckband. Now you're going to want to trim this seam allowance down you will want to leave yourself a little bit larger seam allowance around this area just to make it slightly easier to finish this off neatly later but we're going to trim the rest of this seam allowance down to reduce bulk and then we are going to attach the collar so the next step is to pin our collar to our collar stand that we've attached to the shirt dress and i have the under collar facing the dress so i've got the upper collar the interface piece 
facing up and the unnamed, uninterfaced piece, the under collar, attached to the right side of the interfaced collar stand. I've got that pinned into place. Now, you can base that into place now if you would like to, if your fabric is slippery, or you can take your uninterfaced collar stand, which as you'll remember, we've trimmed an eighth of an inch off of this, so this will need to be stretched again to fit into place. You need to press up the long edge by five eighths of an inch, and we're gonna pin that on top so that it sandwiches our collar in between. And then we're going to sew from the 5 eighths of an inch button band edge here around and back down to the 5 eighths of an inch button band here. And again, if you want to, you can draw in your stitching line around the curve to make sure that you're getting a nice accurate curve around those edges. So once I've got my collar pinned on, I'm then going to pin on my uninterfaced collar stand to sandwich it, and then I will sew this a 5 eighths of an inch the whole way around. So you see, you should end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So I am going to trim down the seam allowance around this edge. I am going to leave it slightly larger at these corners because again it's going to make it easier to finish this neatly if there are slightly larger seam allowances here. Not too large because we don't want this area to be too bulky because we are going to be attempting to put a buttonhole in there. So I'm going to trim this down, turn it through, press it, then I will pin and slip stitch it into place. Then we can move on to buttonholes. Exciting. Okay, so I have slip stitched the collar stand to the interior, so that's all nicely finished now, giving it a good press. Now it's time for buttonholes. So we need to do one buttonhole horizontally on the collar stand, which you can see I've done there, and then we need to do vertical buttons down the band. So I have spaced mine in the center of my band, which has meant that the band itself is at one and a quarter inches across, so they're up five eighths of an inch, so centered. And then I've started five eighths of an inch down from the top. I'm actually putting 13 buttons down the front, and then this is the 14th, and then I'm gonna add two buttons to each, col uh, each cuff. When I marked the buttons on the cuff, you want to make sure you're doing it on the upper cuff, which is the part with the continuous lap turned under and sewn under because the cuff is going to button up over so that it should be it should be obvious because it will be natural how that wants to go and I've put two buttonholes on the cuff and they are five eighths of an inch away from the edge and then five eighths of an inch away from the folded edge of the cuff and then the folded edge of the cuff here. So basically five eighths of an inch in and five eighths of an inch down. I just like how that looks. If I had had more buttons I could possibly have put three buttons on the cuff but I only have 20 of these coconut shell half inch buttons left so I am putting two on each cuff, one at the collar and then 13 down the front. So I have marked all the placement for all of my buttons on and I'm gonna go through with my machine and put the buttons in. My machine has an automatic buttonhole feature. I won't show you or tell you how to do buttonholes because my machine does, as I say, like I just measure the button on screen press a button and then it does it. So you need to work out how your machine does buttonholes and you want to put your buttonholes in. 13 down the front, one at the collar, two on each cuff, 20 in total. So I'm gonna get all of those done and then I'll show you how I treat the buttonholes before I op open them and how I position my buttons. 20 buttonholes later. <laughs> so only one of them really, really fluffed up. And of course that one fluffed up on a nice obvious piece there. It was just a bit wider at the top, but never mind, it's at the bottom. And again, if anyone gets close enough to be able to say to me that my buttonholes look wonky, then they're getting too close. So before I open up my buttonholes, I want to mark on the placement for my buttons. So I am going to do that by lining up the button bands and pinning it together all the way down so that everything is nice and level. And I wanna make sure that my waist seams are matching up and that the hem's matching up. So I go through and put pins in all the way along. So once I've done that, get a few more in just so that this bit's definitely secure. So I'm gonna do that the whole way down. So once I've done that, I am going to take a, another pin and I'm gonna poke it through the buttonhole towards the top of the buttonhole because if you look at the buttonhole place button and buttonhole placement on your pattern pieces the buttons go get placed towards the top of the buttonholes. I'm going to poke it through and I'm going to take 
depending on which background I'm on, this one's on one of the white bark tree branches. So I'm going to take my friction pen and just make a mark. And I'm going to do that all the way down. So this one is on the dark green. So I will use my chalk marker. And I'm going to mark my buttonhole, my button placement all the way down the button band that way. And I'll do the same for the button at the neck and then the buttons on the cuffs. Once I've marked those all in, I'll unpin everything and then I can treat my buttonhole. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Okay, so I have marked all my button placement and I am now going to go through and treat all of my buttonholes and I use Fray Check for that. I am going to, and I do this before I open my buttonholes because I find that it helps negate or limit the fraying. So I'm gonna cover each buttonhole in Fray Check and I'm gonna do that on both sides and again this is before I open them up I find that when I do th do it this way they do still fray a little bit but it's much easier kind of to trim that fraying away so I'm going to do that for every single buttonhole and I'll allow that to dry whilst I'm sewing on the buttons so I'm going to get that done next then I'm going to hem it and then our dress is done so ideally you would have a buttonhole chisel and a mat to um, open up your buttonholes. But since we've moved, we've lost ours, we don't know where it's gone. So I am putting a pin through the end of my buttonhole and I'm taking my sharp unpicker and I'm gonna open up my buttonhole. And that pin through the end won't let me go any further so that I don't rip my buttonhole further than I want it to be open. And you kind of don't wanna risk that. I haven't ever done it, so I can't say ask me how I know, but thankfully I've always used the pin method. So you'll only get so far with the pin in there. So I like to go in from the other end and I'm not gonna put the pin in because I'm just gonna open up that little bit that's left at the end of my buttonholes. So I should then be able to feed my buttons through and then we have a nicely finished cuff. So I'm gonna do the same for all the buttonholes down at the center front and at the neckline. And then I need to hem the, or sew down the bias binding. And I'm gonna do that by slip stitching it the entire way around. Again, you, depending on how you want to finish yours, you could do a double turned hem. You will have need to have made this decision before you put your button bands on so that you can put your button bands on. But I need to just slip stitch the bias binding to the outer fabric. And I'm gonna do that as invisibly as possible. And then my dress will be finished, which is very exciting. I cannot wait to see how this looks. If you have any questions at all, please let me know in the comment section down below and I will do my best to answer them for you. So again, this is an absolute favorite. I absolutely love this dress. Highly, highly recommend it. I definitely think a drapier fabric like a viscose or a crepe is the way forward. You could do this in a cotton lawn, but you wouldn't want anything heavier than that. I don't think I, I like the drape and the swish that this lightweight fabric gives. So yeah, you wouldn't want anything heavier than, than a cotton lawn. That would be the absolute heaviest that I would go to. I think I prefer these sleeves in a viscose because there's just more fluidity and drape to them. I think it might be too stiff in a cotton lawn. But again, if you do decide to make this dress, remember to tag me on Instagram with the hashtag Shan made me do it so that I can see your makes because I would love to see what your interpretation of this pattern is like and how you choose to highlight or camouflage all the little details. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't yet, please subscribe and I'll see you again very soon. Bye!